recapping our webinar series, Selecting and Adapting Online Materials for Online Language Learning and Teaching. Our very first session was with Billy Meinke Lau on working with Open Educational Resources or OERs. And he was kind enough to provide us this link, which is our OER training guide. And if you can't reach it through the presentation, which I'm not sure if you'd be able to do, um, perhaps somebody might be so kind to paste that into the chat. But this is a free resource for all educators to use to learn how to use OERs. So if it's something that interests you, but you might feel a little bit intimidated in trying it out on your own, I would definitely point you to this resource. It's there for you to check at any time and you can always go back and reread things. So it covers, among other things, Open Educator Resources 101, so the very basics of using our OERs. It also covers copyright and creative commons for OERs, as well as OER adaptation and creation. So those are all topics definitely worth checking out. To recap, what are OERs? So OERs, um, in a nutshell, these are any learning, teaching, or research resources that are both free of cost and come with reuse rights. This includes a wide variety of resources such as textbooks, full courses, journal articles, data sets, and interactive learning content. OERs are separated from other free content by the reuse rights that have been granted through the open copyright licensing system, such as Creative Commons, for example. With these rights or these permissions, we're able to adapt OER content for various contexts without worrying that we're running afoul of copyright law. Without an open license, free content is probably not OER, so we do want to really differentiate the licensing factor and the permissions given to use and shape these materials as we see fit. Why should we use OERs? There's two primary motivators. One, to save money for students on their course materials, as that's always an important uh, facet for our students. Free resources help them to level the playing field, as so students from all economic backgrounds have the same access to the same materials. It also helps us to facilitate academic innovation, so when educators and students can collaborate and use the materials to serve their specific needs. Students can spend more time practicing the skills that they really need to climb that ladder of proficiency. Now, OERs are possible, as I said before, through open licenses. These are important because they make it clear on how others can use your work. The Creative Commons licenses are interoperable, so we can remix OER with different licenses. These licenses also make it very easy to share with different permissions and all the licenses include a requirement for attribution or giving credit to the creator. Finding OERs can be a bit of a challenge, but there are some resources to try. So Billy mentioned institutional repositories, IRs, and these are kept mainly by higher education institutions in order to store OERs and adapt them by the faculty and the staff. And usually within these IRs, the full downloads of your OER content are hosted there, so you don't have to go out to another site to download them. Open repositories provide free hosting for OER content and typically offer services that make it easy to find and curate OER on the platform, and full downloads are also typically hosted here. We also have referatories, which are websites that curate reviews and collections of OERs, but they'll send visitors out to websites other than those places to access the content. And we also have search tools like Google Advanced Search and Creative Commons Search to help you find some OERs that might work for you. In our second session, we had Leslie Baldwin, who shared with us how to adapt and scaffold online materials for different proficiency levels. So we had a recap of the actual proficiency levels. These are important to be familiar with as students who are on different levels are going to have different goals and different experiences in class. Remember at a high level, the advanced levels, uh, superior levels, they're typically speaking in paragraph level speech. So they're able to narrate, describe things in the past and in the future. And they can also deal with those unexpected complication situations. 
In the intermediate, we had the analogy of them being the survivors. So they're typically speaking at a sentence level. They can create things with language and create simple speech, simple conversations. They can ask and respond to questions. But again, they're kind of survivors. If they are put in some situations where um, they aren't sure what to do with them, that will sometimes send them for a loop. And at the novice level, we have the analogy of the parrot, where they're communicating minimally with very formulaic and predictable sentences. They also make a lot of lists and use a lot of set phrases. So these proficiency levels are going to be important whenever you are choosing materials. So how does this impact our planning and our assessments? So we have this chart that was provided to us. Remember that you need to think about performance versus proficiency. So performance, those are the things that we're basing on the classroom instruction. So how well are your students grasping the concepts that you're teaching? And how comfortable are they with those? Are they able to complete the assignments? Whereas proficiency, this is the, the things that are happening independent of specific classroom instruction. It could happen at any time, at any place where students are acquiring the language. And in proficiency exercises, generally these exercises are spontaneous, they're not rehearsed, and they often will mimic real world situations where students could sometimes get into territory they're not familiar with or maybe feel uncomfortable with. Um, whereas performance, generally it's very uh, much a closed uh, container type of environment where students are going to know what to expect. And again, those parrots are going to be ready to parrot back what they've learned in class. So it's important to consider performance versus proficiency when you're creating assessments. And we had this adorable little picture of the real duck versus the rubber duck. It's very important with our language courses to use these authentic resources. So materials like texts and video or an audio that were created for real world situations by proficient language users. So these weren't designed specifically for language learners. This is the real duck versus the rubber duck, which is designed for a language learner. So it's important to try to push our students outside of their comfort zones as if they're going into Madrid to maybe sit down and eat at a restaurant. They're not going to be sitting and working with those rubber ducks. They're going to be working with the real ducks, the menus, interacting with the wait staff and functioning in that real world environment. So the more we can use authentic resources for our students, the easier it will be for them. It's also important to focus on task, not text. So remember, with authentic texts, these are often going to be materials that are a little bit beyond students' comfort zones and beyond what their proficiency level is at as of right now. But that doesn't mean that the resource can't be used at all. So we can use the text for multiple proficiency levels. And as instructors, we can help the students navigate through those authentic resources with confidence so they're able to create with the language and use those authentic texts. Remember, it doesn't necessarily have to be to the level of your students. Use scaffolding if needed and try to help them navigate and finish the task that you've assigned for them. But remember that the task needs to be in alignment with the proficiency level of the students. So I'm not going to say put an infographic down that's designed for proficient language users to my novice level students and say, here you go, write a 10 piece reflection page in the target language. It would be more like make some lists, ask basic questions, what colors do you see and recite the colors in the target language. So if the task is in alignment with the proficiency of the students, they're going to feel comfortable enough to use that authentic text and not shy away from it. And then some example resources that we were given are things like newspaper articles, websites, blogs, online videos. That's certainly not a full listing. There are a lot of resources out there for authentic text. And it helps, I think, especially with students who are novice level learners to use a lot of visuals. It's going to help students with their context and it'll keep them engaged with the content. I think you're more likely to engage with a brightly colored infographic rather than uh, just some text written on a page. In our third session, we learned how to select and adapt online materials for the interpretive mode of communication. And we had Jesse Gleason join us for that session. 
And she gave us this chart that I think will be very helpful to keep in mind about our modes of communication. So her presentation dealt with the interpretive mode, which is highlighted in the middle. But if you look at all the descriptions of the interpersonal as well as presentational, a lot of this stuff commingles and intertwines with each other. But for now, at least, we'll keep an eye on the interpretive mode. So this is generally one-way communication where the audience doesn't have very much, if any, interaction um, with the producer. And they have to not only understand what the, the messages of the material, but also being able to read between the lines and derive things related to culture and other things that aren't explicitly written on the page. So the ideal interpretive materials are multimodal. And as we talked about in our panel, as the world continues to change and become more technology integrated, it's going to be a lot more common that our students are going to interact with for example, videos that have audio and linguistic, they might also have gestures, um, spatial pieces, but there's a lot of different things to keep in mind whenever you are working with interpretive models as they are multimodal typically. We do want to go with authentic text whenever possible. These again are works created by people and for people who are higher in the language levels of proficiency but they can also be ideal resources for language learners as well if we put them in the right context and use them in the right ways. So a few rules of thumb that Jesse gave us for selecting multimodal text. One being look for text that address the topic of the unit. And this was a little counterintuitive for me, honestly, but she also said to not look for text that have specific vocabulary words, grammar and structures. So what we want to do is find the text that addresses the topic and then as teachers we can provide the scaffolding they need to maybe also address the different vocabulary and grammar we need to. But again, look for the topic, not necessarily the grammar vocabulary and things like that. She also gave us some questions to consider how do learners demonstrate their understanding other than just translating. And what are some of the before, during, and after listening, reading, and viewing activities that will improve understanding? So these are all things we should consider as we hunt for our resources. So when we go to assess student performance, it's recommended that instructors use interpretive rubrics and interpretive task templates to help them assess student performance with their interpretive tasks. So we have interpretive task templates we can use to ask students to find information in the authentic text. And activities can be basic things like identifying some key words. And then we move on to some of the more advanced tasks like identifying some supporting details used in comprehension. And we can use interpretive rubrics and they can help us to evaluate how students did with the task and gauge how much they're understanding. In session four with Dr. Bobby Hobgood, we learned about selecting and adapting online materials for the interpersonal mode of communication. So the interpersonal mode of communication, these are two-way exchanges, and I've highlighted here with that green arrow that they are spontaneous and unpredictable. As often we're having conversations with each other, we can sometimes go off on different topics and different tangents. And again, that spontaneous, not predictable, not using the script is how interpersonal communication is really highlighted here. Remember, we use this for helping each other, follow up, following up and reacting to each other, maintaining conversation. And then there's some other things too, like maintaining eye contact, using body language, focusing on the message, and then asking for that additional clarification when necessary. So these are all things to think about when creating your interpersonal materials. When we're looking for online materials for the interpersonal region, we want to ask these questions. How is the task impacted by the online course? Is the resource internal or external to the online course? And keeping in mind maybe some copyright pieces as well. Is the synchronous or asynchronous? This will be especially important in the online world where folks are often doing the work asynchronously, but maybe meeting synchronously at certain times in order to practice. 
Also, how can I address the learner's needs if I'm not there? That can be really important if the learner needs some help and we're not maybe necessarily there to chime in right away. How do I ensure spontaneity? And then finally, how will I evaluate them? So all things to keep in mind when you're searching for your online materials. So Dr. Hovgood gave us a few best practices to help us ensure spontaneity. He recommends to provide a model in advance. Now, while this might seem a little bit counterintuitive where you're giving students an example of how their conversation, for example, might go, it helps them to maybe plan a little bit, but also not giving them the answers completely. So it's a nice balance between helping them to plan, but also leaving it open-ended so they can create their own uh, meanings and their own ideas. We we'll also want to remind students how to be evaluated. That's where the rubrics come in handy. We want to have very clear and transparent evaluation criteria so that way students feel empowered and able to participate in the task. We'll reveal partners shortly before the exchange, which can be important to make sure that folks aren't uh, chatting a little bit ahead of time. We want to keep it spontaneous and unprepared and also require all the students to record at once. That takes care of the uh, possibility that some students might wait and maybe listen to some recordings and then go in and give their submissions. Dr. Hobgood also told us the importance about activity design and the differentiation between if it's an exercise or a task. So if it's an exercise, this is a it's exercise or an activity that focuses really on one correct example of the language it uses the language out of context. It really focuses on providing small amounts of languages, maybe doesn't necessarily focus on that meaningful communication and it dictates the language structures and vocabulary. So these are generally very uh, closed ended where you're kind of looking for a specific response, whereas a task more open ended, it focuses on achieving communication the meaningful use of language, it employs communication strategies, it doesn't use predictable language, it also links language, to language use to the context and does not dictate language structure, so it's more open-ended. And again, this is more focused on students' true proficiency. What are they able to do with the language versus what are they able to pair it back with an exercise? So he gives a few example tasks here. So a few that might uh, go well in the online environment are small talk, maybe between a group of students and a instructor in a small online classroom, kind of like what we're doing with Zoom right now. I like the idea of interviewing someone. That's a great way to uh, learn from others as well as learn how to ask and respond to questions. And making plans to do something that could be done online. I like the idea also of making a purchase. That could be a fun activity with a little bit of online shopping. Chatting online obviously lends itself very well. Also discussing events or collaborating on projects might be great tasks for the online world. So next we have our bit about selecting materials for our interpersonal tasks. And we wanna go with these four points here. They all start with A. So if you remember the four A's, that will help. We wanna make sure they're authentic. So again, they're prepared for and used by target language users, not learners. They need to be accessible, so they should be appropriate for students' age as well as their proficiency level. And as teachers, if we need to provide the scaffolding, we can do that, but we wanna make sure that students can use the material, make sure they're accessible. Also should be at an appropriate level of rigor and challenge. Ideally, it's also going to be rich in visual support Cognates, if that's possible, known words, and also linked to some prior knowledge. It should also be appealing. We should try to connect things to real life, keep it interesting for students, make it attention grabbing, and maybe a little bit novel and humorous. Um, memes come to mind for that for sure. And finally, we want to make sure that they're aligned. They need to be matched to the learning targets, and the students need to have opportunities to practice their interpretive skills with these materials. They should also be great springboards for interpersonal and presentational tasks, as well as sources of comprehensible input. And then we have this chart that helps us to see the difference between assessing performance versus assessing proficiency. So again, with our more closed-ended performance tasks, we're focusing on 
more specifics. We're looking for more specific answers and they're probably going to be within a smaller range. Whereas when we assess proficiency, we're more focused on what the students can do rather than what they can't do. And we're not as concerned as far as when and how the language was acquired. This is more about what students are able to do with all of the knowledge that they've accumulated. And also make sure that the proficiency tasks are spontaneous. We need to make sure that they are not rehearsed and that students are sort of getting outside of their comfort zone rather than maybe being asked a certain set of questions with a performance. So this guide will help us to illustrate the difference between when we assess performance versus assessing proficiency. We also got some great rubrics for assessment. So I just screenshotted a few of these um, the one that's over on the left was created by a colleague of Dr. Hobgood's for a specific uh, task that they were having the students do. And again, if it's something more specific, you can cater the rubric a little bit more to the task that you're having the students do. Uh, the talk scores on the other end of the spectrum in the lower right hand corner, those are very open ended. And again, those are going to be better for assessing proficiency. Um, rather than just assessing for what students are able to do with um, a more closed ended task. And then this one up in the top right hand corner came from the Ohio Department of Education where you have a performance rubric where it's based on what you can do, your strengths, and then what are your goals. So the things that you still have some ways to go on. In session five, we had Dr. Anna Othkoth, who told us about selecting and adapting online materials for the presentational mode of communication. So to recap, what is the presentational mode? In this mode, the learner, as a speaker or a writer, is going to create a work for a distant audience. And the key here is that the interaction with the audience is either going to be not possible or rather limited. And the outcome can either be a planned or formalized speech, an act, oration, a written document. Um, as technology continues to change, we will have different modes of um, presentational communication coming up in the near future, I'm sure. And again, we can use different things like podcasts, blogs, social media platforms, videos, and different tools like that and create items in the presentational mode on any of those platforms. And again, as technology continues to change, I'm sure that the way that students are going to need to learn to communicate in the target language will continue to evolve as we continue to use more platforms like these. We also learned about multimodality and hybridity. So when we use multiple modes of communication in the presentational mode, it's becoming much more common um, as we become more technologically integrated that we are giving presentations. So for example, if I post on Twitter, generally that's more of a presentational thing. I might be able to get a few comments, but again, it's a very limited interaction that I would have with my audience. Um, the hybridity also allows us to mix and remix old and new content to up together to create new meetings. Um, memes come to mind using a photo and adding some new captions to create something new. And remixing and mashing up materials is not the same as just copying as we're adding new meaning to the work. So these are all things that we'll want to keep in mind for the presentational mode. For the presentational mode in the 21st century, as technology continues to evolve, the presentational mode has evolved and will continue to evolve and change as well. And the presentational mode these days incorporates often uh, multiple modes of communication. So it's important that our students are savvy technology users in order to communicate in the presentational mode in the 21st century. As instructors, it's really important for us to encourage students to embrace the new media technology and offer some guidance on how to use these tools along the way. And some tools that were recommended are screencasts or meeting with our students in a virtual classroom or through tools like Skype where we can give them the guidance they need to use the new tools and show off their language skills using the new technology. In session six, we talked about adapting and selecting online materials for the teaching of culture. And we have the mantra of lead with culture. So I was very happy to see that this was included with our series. 
Culture is often a big inspiration for students in order to study languages, but this topic in particular, it can sometimes take a bit of a backseat to other lessons in order for us to meet our course requirements and standards. And online instructors have the ability to teach culture to students through programs kind of like the NCVPS Culture Cafe, in which instructors or community members or other folks come in and create some presentations for the students with some type of a topic of interest in mind and they're able to share their stories and experiences directly with the students. And I think this is also a great way to build connections with students as teachers often have their own stories and their photos and experiences related to the culture of the language that they teach. So students can go and share these experiences, share their stories with the students and build really strong connections with them. Remember that the internet allows the online instructor the freedom to go into a virtual classroom and share those cultural experiences on topics that the students um, or even sometimes the instructor can share their passions and teach students about the topics that are not included with the curriculum. And not a lot of prep necessarily is required for these sessions. We can sometimes turn on our web cameras and share different souvenirs, things we've picked up in the countries we visited, crafts, um, do some how-to tutorials, so cooking or showing them how to create crafts or art with the students. And usually those don't require a lot of preparation. And culture lessons help the students to put the language into perspective. It also helps them to inspire them and continue to study the language by keeping it fun and interesting for them. I definitely would want to encourage everyone to consider piloting a program at your organization like the NCVPS Culture Cafe where folks can come in and share culture. I find that this is a great way to recruit students. It's a great way to keep them studying with you and build connections. So if you are interested in piloting a program and you need a guest speaker, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to uh, go and do a presentation for your organization and get the ball rolling with a culture program if you're interested. In session seven, we had Catherine Murphy Judy teach us about helping learners to select and adapt online materials to enable self-directed learning. And as the internet continues to grow and change, I think that self-directed learning is going to become a lot more of the norm and more typical for our students. So this was a great topic to review. And to recap, what is self-directed learning? Here's a definition, but not the definition. This comes from Malcolm Knowles. And the definition is self-directed learning describes a process in which individuals take the initiative with or without the help of others in diagnosing their learning needs, formulating learning goals, identifying human and material resources for learning, choosing and implementing appropriate learning strategies and evaluating learning outcomes. So while that is a definition, certainly not the definition as that will continue to grow and change. So there are four steps we can use in self-directed learning. Step one is to assess the readiness to learn. Students will need to make sure that they are ready and able to start their journeys. So doing a self-assessment is a great way to start off. In the second step, that's where we actually set the learning goals. So students go through and communicate their learning goals uh, maybe to themselves or they write it out for them to go back and reference or maybe if they have an advisor helping them they'll communicate their goals to their advisor. In step three they will engage in the actual learning process and finally in step four they'll go back and evaluate the learning. So these steps are all really important and it's likely that as students are going through on their journeys they may visit or revisit some of these steps at different portions to help them continue to decide what they're going to do next and how they're making progress. To assess readiness to learn, there are a lot of great tools out there. Language portfolios like the Lingbafolio or the European Language Portfolio are great ways to help students assess if they are ready. They typically will complete their self-assessments and that's going to help them determine how they learn best. And it's also going to help them to define their goals for learning in order to help them plan their studies. There are also some great online self-assessment tools out there available in multiple languages and they're often free. There's just a matter of finding those tools and leveraging them. 
and students can use them multiple times during their journeys to assess their progress and then make new plans based on their results. So students will often be doing a lot of reflection during their learning journeys and sometimes taking assessments multiple times. We also have to help us the question formulation technique or the QFT. And this starts off with the question focus. This is a stimulus or a springboard that's used to ask questions. The Q focus can be a topic, an image, a phrase, some type of a situation that's gonna serve as that focus for genuating questions. And it should be a clear thought provoking topic and not a question. So I think one of the examples was that there was a quick blurb about how a baguette has three ingredients and it needs to be in certain specifications in France. So that should get students thinking and it's gonna start them off on their journey. So something that's going to provoke thought and isn't going to be a question directed right at the student, it's more of a statement. So our rules for producing questions, we want to do that as our second step. So students want to ask as many questions as they can. We're not going to stop to discuss or judge or answer any of these questions. We're just writing the questions down, writing them down as is, and if any statements come up, just change those into a question. So this is sort of the brain dump mode where we're thinking of as many questions as possible, not judging and just putting them down to paper. Next we'll be in the producing questions, we'll be working, having students typically work together to uh, refine and improve those questions. Then we'll categorize the questions, the C for closed, O for open-ended questions. So if a question can often be answered with a quick, few words or a sentence, that would be a closed-ended question. For an open-ended question, that might be something that would require a lot more research and a lot more explanation to answer the question. Finally, we'll want to go back and prioritize those questions. We'll want to establish the priorities and choose the questions based on the actions we'll want to take. As next steps, we'll put the questions into actions. So the instructor would share the criteria on what to do with the questions at that time. And after that's completed, students would do a reflection. So this process is very helpful for students in order to continue to decide what they want to learn, what they want to work on, and then the instructors can give them the instructions and they can evaluate how the students do with those. In session eight, we had information on copyrights and Creative Commons licensing. This is always a hot topic in the online world. And we had that from Dan Sonneson. And talking a little bit about copyright. So the definition that we use in the United States is that copyright pertains to original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression, now known or later developed from which they can be perceived reproduced or otherwise communicated, either directly or with the aid of a machine or service. In no case does copyright protection for an original work of authorship extend to any idea, procedure, process system, method of operation, concept, principle, or discovery, regardless of the form which is described, explained, illustrated, or embodied in such work. And I don't know about you, but after reading that definition, I'm left a little bit confused and befuddled as to what exactly that means. And a lot of lawyers out there who are legal experts often find copyright law uh, somewhat confusing and cumbersome. But one other thing to keep in mind is that copyright and intellectual property rights vary greatly from country to country. So United States law may not apply in another part of the world. So the question that often comes up is, so what can teachers and students use with our copyright law? And the answer is, it depends. So some factors to consider, obviously copyright law in your country. If something's clearly under the protection of copyright, that would be something we'd not be able to use, at least in the form that it's in currently. You'll also wanna factor in rules and guidelines of your educational organization. These are gonna vary a bit from place to place. Some places have a lot of very strict and clear guidelines about what is okay to use and what is not okay to use. So always go back to the rules and the guidelines of your educational organization first and foremost before considering using a work that's not your own. Fair use is also another important concept uh, fair use comes down to the character of the use, the nature of the work, 
the amount of the work used, the effect on the market value of the work used. Fair use is a very gray area. And sometimes there are questions that come up with that and you're not entirely sure if a specific use of a work falls under the fair use category or not. The good news is there are some tools out there like the interactive fair use analysis tool from the University of Minnesota Libraries. This is a great tool to go through and use and it gives you some reflection questions to help you determine whether or not uh, using a resource would fall under the fair use category or if it might be a copyright infringement. Now that's not always going to be correct, so it's important to make sure that you do your homework and abide by copyright law. A great way to leverage resources you haven't created but you'd like to use in your online class is by using open license resources. It's possible to use resources with open licenses and resources like Creative Commons, Wikimedia Commons, Google Advanced Search, also public domain materials. And these images often have the attributions right in them and they abide by the guidelines the author has established for use of those materials. A good best practice is to include the TASL attributions. It's an easy way to be sure you're in compliant. And luckily, these are often included whenever you go to use materials like this. There are a lot of resources out there that will put the citation in there for you. So going back to our content um, in terms of our overall webinar, um, just a few reminders as we close out. If you are earning a badge or you're planning to earn a badge, be sure that you have completed all the activities that are required. Now you can earn the badge for the materials SNA badge if you have done the following. So you want to make sure that you've learned about the materials with selection and adaptation and online language courses. Be sure you've attended at least four of the live webinars. Make sure you've actively participated in discussions and activities during the live webinars. We also require that you've reposted your responses to the discussion prompts and all the TED Ed lessons. Those were sent out through email, through the email address that you registered with. And finally, be sure to complete a three to one reflection for each webinar session. I'm going to post um, some of these links in the chat in just a moment, but remember our series website to access all these materials is listed here. And this was also sent out in the emails that you use to register for the webinar series. So you'll be able to go back and access the series website for access to the TED Ed lessons, as well as going back and revisiting these materials as you see fit. I also created a badge tutorial video um, this is basically just the video that I created, but it focuses a little bit more on how to earn the badge and some of the steps that you'll need to take in order to earn the badge. Mahalo and thank you for attending. It has been fantastic getting to know all of you and working with all of you during the webinar series. If you need help on anything or have some questions about things, need some guidance on earning the badge, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. And again, my name is Sarah Booten and my email is listed there, sarah.booten at ncpublicschools.gov. So if you have questions or need some assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am more than happy to assist. You can also reach me on Twitter at Booten Sensei if you wanna send me a quick tweet and let me know if you have any questions. But again, thank you for attending. We appreciate your participation. And without all the great interaction from all of our participants, we wouldn't be able to have these fantastic webinar series. So thank you very much for attending. And we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar series. Mm -hmm.